Great. Thank you, Joyce. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending today. Um, I'm going to be talking about Power BI and a little bit about um, how to get started. So um, as Joyce said and gave a great introduction um, for me, my name is Alyssa Ford. I'm the Director of Consulting Services at Tech Impact. I use pronouns she, her, and I am um, I lead a team of individuals at Tech Impact, the consulting team, and we focus on helping organizations um, use technology, but also implement technology and look at the data that they have. Um, as an organization, we offer a lot of different services. Some are tech services like managed IT support, um, cloud services, some fall in the consulting team. Um, which would be cloud-based support, cloud-based implementation, um, data analysis, which is what we're gonna focus on today, visualization and analytics, um, community integrated design. We also have a nonprofit education and training where we do a lot of, um, uh, we have a lot of resources there. We do online trainings, webinars, um, consumer guides, and then we have a workforce development where we do um, certifications for underserved young adults in helping them get started in their careers in the IT field. So that's IT Works, CX Works, and then we also have a an immersive uh, programming boot camp called Punch Code, um, where we do that as well. So um, as a we're also a nonprofit, um, but also we are more than just a tech services partner. We focus on advancing the sector through technology. Um, we've, in the last 16 years, we've helped thousands of prof nonprofits do this, and um, we try and stay on top of the latest tools and techniques through partnerships with tech companies, so similar to TechSoup in that manner. So let me go ahead and um, get started for today. So the agenda today, we'll talk a little bit about um, Power BI uh, licensing. Um, we'll go through the basics of Power BI. I wanna show you some ways that we're seeing nonprofits use Power BI to look at their data, maybe give you some ideas on ways that you could get started there. Provide a couple of tics, tips and tricks for how to just get started. What are some best practices? What are some things to think about? And then as Joyce said, we'll do some questions. We'll save some time for questions at the end. So let's go ahead and start with what is Power BI. Power BI is a tool that allows you to connect to data from any source. Um, I would say most sources, there are some database systems it doesn't natively connect with, but if you could export a CSV or an Excel file from that system, Power BI would connect to that Excel file. Um, and then you can use Power BI to aggregate or manipulate that data you can um, perform functions on that data that you would, um, like if you have somebody who takes a piece of data and works with it, formats it, reshapes it, they maybe do these same steps over and over many times, weekly, monthly, Power BI can automate that process for you. Um, and then it provides visualizations which are interactive, allows you to cross filter. So it, it has, the functionality of repeating steps, and it also has the ability to create visualization, so you can actually tell your story through those visuals. Um, Power BI has, there's two applications for Power BI. There's, and there's a desktop application, um, which doesn't require a paid license. There's a free version of Power BI. You can download it to your desktop. Um, and it allows you to connect to all the data sources that you would be able to with a pro version. Um, it allows you to um, create reports, author content, publish those reports to the, reports to the web. There's also a pro license that comes with Power BI. Um, through, if you go through TechSoup to get the nonprofit discounts on the Microsoft 365 products, the pricing for Power BI Pro right now is $3 per user per month gives you access to a lot of the same functionality as the free license does, but there are some additional benefits. So a lot of organizations ask, why do I and why do I need pro licenses? 
Pro licenses are, I would say the easiest, simplest way to say why you need a pro license is to be able to share your report with other users. So pro licenses allow you to create workspaces where you can organize your reports. So you could have one workspace for finance, you could have one workspace for programs. And the reports that are relevant to those departments or those workspaces are all found in one area. It also lets you share your reports with users from those departments. So if you just use the free version, you can create the report, you can publish it, but you're the only person that can access that report. So if you, if you don't have a need to share that report, the free version might work fine for you. But if you need to share it with one of your colleagues or um, with uh, somebody else that you're partnering with, both of you would need to have a pro license in Power BI. Um, so that's to share reports, but also to view those reports that are shared with you. Um, one of the other advantages of a pro license is you can subscribe to reports. And so why I mentioned this is Power BI not only allows you to connect to data and create reports, but once you've published it in the web, it gives you the ability to automatically refresh your data on certain time intervals, and then those reports can be emailed to you. So if you have data and you say, I would like to see this updated dashboard every morning when I first start my day, you could create a report, the data on the back end would refresh automatically, and at a certain time, you know, once a week or once a day in your inbox, you would get a picture of what that report looks like. So Power BI allows you to do all of that. You need a power, you need a pro license to do that though. So let me kind of, now that you know there's two types of licenses, let me take one step backwards. I briefly mentioned Power BI desktop and Power BI in the web. So Power BI Desktop has a couple of advantages. Power BI Desktop allows you to connect to your data source and then manipulate your data source. And when I say manipulate, what I mean is maybe you're connecting to a set of data and you have a column for full name and you need to split that into first name and last name. You could create a step that would allow you to split that column automatically. When you refresh your data, Power BI will have saved that step so it knows exactly how to manipulate that column. You can split things like date and time. You can, um, you can create calculations if you have two columns you need to add together. Um, you can do all of those types of manipulations in Power BI on the desktop. Once the manipulations are done, the, the data looks just like a table, just like an Excel spreadsheet. That spreadsheet is what you then use to create these visualizations, which I'll show a couple slides of some ways that organizations have used visualizations to show their data. Um, and, and those visualizations then can show trends or um, what type of information is in that data. As I mentioned, Power BI Desktop, there's a free download for it. So anybody can download that tool. You don't have to pay for any licensing for it. The second thing is there's a Power BI service. And this is confusing to some users when they first start to log into Power BI. It's like, why would I have a desktop and a web version? What's the difference? In the web, um, usually what happens is you start your report in the desktop, and then you publish it to the web. In the web, you have access to your visualizations. You have access to them anywhere. So anywhere there's a web browser, you can log in and see them. So even if you're not on your computer, you could log in on another computer and see those same reports there. You can also see them from a mobile app or an app on a tablet. So you can log into Power BI and have access to those reports from your tablet. Um, the Power BI service is really powerful when you have the pro license, because that's what allows you to see, as you can see on this page on the, the visualization on the right, you can see the list of different workspaces. And then within those workspaces, you would be able to see the different reports that are available. So if you're going to use the pro service or if you wanna share reports with other users in your organization, you would create the report in the desktop, 
publish it to the web, and then everyone could access it from Power BI service, which is the web application of Power BI. You can use the web to make quick edits, um, but generally I recommend use the, use the desktop to do most of your um, building and creating. So currently, Power BI has 114 native connectors, which means there are 114 different sources that Power BI can pull data from. Um, I've highlighted some of the most common ones that we see on here. Excel is by far the most common. If you have a data source that's not listed, um, you can ex but you can export to Excel or CSV, you can then pull that file in from Power BI. Now, if you need to automate the process, um, some organizations look into scheduling Excel exports from their data source, from whatever their source database is, um, and using that in combination with like a Power Automate to bring that data into Power BI so that the whole refresh process happens seamlessly. That's a workaround we've seen. So, um, but if you have if your data is in a SQL Server or maybe you use Salesforce, um, Power BI connects really cleanly, really nicely to those sources. Um, same with SharePoint, if you create things in a SharePoint list, or you upload that Excel file into SharePoint, Power BI can connect directly to that file from there. If you don't see your data source listed here, I've added a link. Um, a copy of these slides is available in the handout section, so you, you'll be able to see that link there. You can click on that link, it'll show you a list of all of the current sources and it stays up to date as new ones are added. So how are nonprofits using Power BI? We see nonprofits use Power BI in a variety of ways. Those that are just getting started might be using it to just do some data validation, find out where in their data there may be missing information, or where do they have incomplete responses, or data that doesn't make sense. Maybe there's a name field, and somebody put a zip code into it. That wouldn't make sense. You could clearly, you could quickly identify a data discrepancy like that using Power BI. Um, a lot of organizations also use it to answer questions. For example, how many participants did I serve in the last fiscal year? You could have a card that shows just that number. It just shows up on the report with the number of people served. Then you could have a, a slider bar so you could pick the dates. And as you change the dates, it'll show you how many people are served within that period. It also allows you to identify trends. So you might want to look at, was there an increase in need or an increase in, in services that we provided? You could see that. Um, you could create charts over time. You could look at um, needs for certain types of services. And you can start to kind of look at trends. Those might be daily, weekly, monthly, depends what your time frame is that you're looking at. Cultural change is, I think, an interesting one, but one that's very close to my heart. Um, and the cultural change aspect is, what this means is being able to show the people that are doing the work that they're making an impact. So you have data, you're collecting data, you're asking, your staff to collect data, your employees to collect data. And then a lot of times, those employees feel like they're doing a lot of work to collect that information, but they're not really understanding why they're collecting it. So um, I'll show you some example, or I'll show you an example of how at Tech Impact, we try and change the culture around collecting data so that we can say like, we're collecting it for this reason. This is how we show you what we're doing with that data that we're collecting. And lastly, to communicate with constituents. This could be like, you maybe you post an annual report and it refreshes. Um, maybe you have a story to tell about um, fundraising that you've done and um, where, that's, where that funding has gone in your programs or what you've done with that, how it translates into um, constituents that are being served. So a lot of different ways that the that non, we see nonprofits using Power BI. So first, data validation. This is an example of a Power BI report that 
um, each of these blue boxes is actually a button. And what happens is they, this organization has a data set, um, a, big, a large database, and they're trying to follow up on records that have incomplete information or information that might be duplicative or have errors in it. And anywhere they see a count, um, they would be able to click on the blue button next to the count and it would take them to a detailed list of records where that error is occurring. So for example, there's one duplicate record where the phone number and the birthday are the same. So they have information about a, a participant and that, and they have multiple records and they're trying to identify, is it possible that this person was already in our system and someone else entered a duplicate record? They could click on that blue button, it says duplicate phone birthday, and they would see that one record. And then they could go to their database and look at that record and identify, is this really a duplicate? Is this maybe like twins show up a lot in this particular data set? So if there are twins, they might have the same phone number and the same birthday. And then they could clear that error and say, don't show me that error again. Um, and then if you see in the middle of the screen here, view resolved errors, they could then see a spreadsheet of the errors that they've said are legitimate. They're not actually errors. They've double checked them. They've validated them. That data is good. So you can add filters to these pages if you need to, so you can see where these particular um, participants are or um, to look at this over a specific period of time. But eventually what happens is this becomes, for this organization, this became a, something that they looked at weekly. So they cleaned up all the records and then every week they can go back and look at it and determine you know, how many records have been entered in the last week that don't have that information. That allows them to almost immediately go back and make sure like, why didn't you capture this information? Is there something we're doing that we can fix to help capture that information more reliably? Organizations also use this to answer questions. So you'll see on here, um, Power BI has a way of cross filtering. So this is just gonna, this visualization, this visual will just repeat itself. Um, but what you'll see is you can click into the different portions of the pie chart and notice that it'll highlight the other pie charts to show you the subset of data that fits into that. So we looked at, cases that are less than a month old, and then we could filter on a status or when were they last touched. So we look at cases less than a month, and then we also wanna look at, of those, how many haven't been touched at all, and of those, how many were transferred to someone else. So that would help us identify, uh, maybe there's something we should look at. These are very unique. These are six or seven cases that are not very old, they've recently been looked at, um, or they haven't been looked at at all, but they're moving around between people frequently. So instead of having that case just bounce from person to person to person, a manager can step in and say, why do we keep moving this? Like, let's actually look at it, let's actually address it. So this is one way that we can use Power BI to answer the question, what cases could potentially have issues or are we transferring very frequently? And we can cross filter across many visualizations to see that. Another example is in identifying trends. So um, the image here on the left is um, data from, um, is a, it's a public data set from the Austin Animal shelter and we actually in the resources you'll see there's a link to another um, video recording that we do that walks you through how to use an excel file and actually create this visual here that you're seeing on the left um, but what you can see here is you can see a trend in if you know if you look at the scatter chart at the bottom you can see the number of days that an animal typically stays in the shelter across how old that animal is when upon intake. So you can kind of see like animals that are younger come in and typically spend less time in the shelter. They kind of peak around 10 or 11, animals seem to stay 
in the shelters longer at that age, and then it drastically recline, declines. And we'd say that's maybe because senior rescues come in and pull animals from the shelter. So you could kind of see what does that trend look like using Power BI. Similarly on the right, um, this is the US Census data. And so here we're just looking at um, Louisiana, we're looking at the population there and we're looking at median housing value. Um, so you can kind of see how the value goes up in certain areas. If we look at New Orleans, it's you know very large. If we look at Baton Rouge, it's very large. Those are big cities there. Um, if we look in some of the suburb areas, the housing values seem to decrease and the population seems to decrease in those areas as well. So we might just be able to identify like, are we, you know, this data might be useful to see, are we providing programs in areas, like are we providing enough programs or enough resources in areas that are highly populated or that meet these certain demographic requirements? Cultural change. So this is our office. Um, these are our boards. This is why I say this is, oh, this is an example for how Tech Impact uses Power BI. Um, our managed services has one component of it is a help desk. And what we like to take a look at all the time are cases that are open, open. How are we serving our clients? Making sure we're meeting their needs when they submit a ticket. And um, we put these on giant TVs so that everybody that's working on the desk can look up at any time and see what is the feedback? What are our surveys saying? How many cases do we have in the queue? Who's currently working on them? How long have those cases been open for? And so we can see, are we meeting the expectations that our clients have of us? And as soon as we fall below whatever that expectation is, it's visible to everyone. So everyone knows, okay, we've, we need to change something. We need to fix something. This does two things. It closes that feedback loop. So we don't have to wait until a client comes to tell us that they're dissatisfied to know that they are. And it, it also allows us to reduce the time between seeing an outcome and the point of when we collected the data. So this is happening in almost real time. We see the data being collected and we can make changes very quickly to make sure that we're meeting our goals. So in our case, it's this particular use case is the help desk, but it could be um, it could be a communication goes out. How fast do we have a response or how fast do, our, do we start to reach uh, constituents? Or it can be anything. It can be, you know, we're passing out a certain, um, item in school backpacks and now we need to make a change because more kids are like in need something like that like there's a very instant feedback for what are we doing can we make a small change if we make that small change did it make things better or worse and also the people who are actually hands-on doing the work can see oh it, i am making an impact like I packed six, 10 school lunches today, but we passed out over 200, you know, so that's a bigger number. That's a way that people can see what they're doing. And then the last one is communicating to constituents. Um, at Tech Impact, we do this through our annual report. Um, our annual report connects our Salesforce data and our QuickBooks data into a single report, which refreshes itself every 12 hours. So our annual report's up to date every 12 hours. Um, one thing to note here is that, note how, notice how I said we pull from Salesforce and QuickBooks. Power BI can pull from multiple data sources and link them together. So you don't have to pull from your, um, programs, databases, separate from finance, separate from um, like if you have a CRM or a donor database, you can pull all of those sources into Power BI and you can connect them on either unique identifiers like you know a client ID or a participant ID or on a date field. So you could say 
I want to look at programs. I also want to look at finances. I also want to look at donations all within the first quarter. And you could just filter on a date field and it would show you all the information from all those systems. Um, so for us, our annual report, this took the place of our annual report starting in 2016 and it's been posted live since. Um, we're currently in the process of updating it. Power BI looks a lot different than it did in 2016. There's a lot of new functionality. So if anybody does go look at that, what you see today and what you see next week will look very different. Um, but Power BI allows data to be available as soon as it's available. You don't have to wait to print it and send it out. It can be available right away. Maybe you want to create like a board report that's available right away. That could be emailed to you every week. And then when you're ready, you could forward the appropriate ones onto the board. Um, you could export it to a PDF and include it in the agenda for the next meeting. Um, so there are a lot of different ways to use Power BI to communicate with your constituents. Okay, so getting started. So we've talked about Power BI being a tool, a lot of different tools built into one that can be used in a lot of different ways by nonprofits, which can be very overwhelming when you first are getting started. So my recommendation first is to go download the desktop application. It's free. You can connect to a simple Excel sheet from your computer um, and you can start to play in the application without trying to do too much complex connecting or querying. We added a link on here for a video that I created called No Analyst Required. It walks you step by step through how to connect that Austin Animal Shelter data from that data source all the way through to the visualization we showed in here. So you can cross filter, you can identify trends, but it shows you step by step so you can get comfortable with how to do things like get the data, pull it in. How do I create a visual? Like, do I just it's, do I just click a button and it happens? Do I click a button and drag fields in? It walks you through that. Um, Microsoft has some great resources. They have a section called Guided Learning, which is a series of five to six minute videos that walk you step by step through all the functionality in Power BI. Now there's hours and hours of videos, but the first two or three sections um will get you started so that you can feel comfortable with just like how do i get the pull the data source in how do i create my first visualization how what does cross filtering mean how do i do cross filtering in power bi those guided video those guided guided learning videos are great i also like that they're short so five to six minutes at a time you don't have to sit through an hour-long video and hit pause right pause while you try and do it pause while you try and do it and it takes you two hours to get through so they have a great guided learning video series. Once you get a data source connected or pulled in, my recommendation is to start with either looking at a quick trend, like put in a chart over time, see what you see, like what does the data show over time? Learn how to filter and cross filter the report. So you can put filters on the report so you only see certain data, very similar to how you can filter a column in Excel, and it'll filter the, it'll only show you the rows where the column meets that criteria. You can do that same thing in Power BI, but you can have a bunch of filters, and they, um, they're a little bit easier to use because it's not tabular. I would recommend creating a table. Um, a lot of what I showed you today in Power BI was visuals, charts, and pie charts, and bar graphs. I recommend creating a table at first so that you see that the data you brought in looks really familiar. You can basically recreate your flat data file in Power BI as a table. I always think that's a great start. The other reason a table comes in handy is if when you create a visual, it doesn't look like what you expect it to look like. If you convert it to a table, you can see what the raw data actually is. And then start with some data validation. So pull in some of your data source and see you know, filter on records that have a blank value in a certain column. See what that is missing. 
or look at look at data that is unexpected. So you might have a field where you're expecting an email address. Look for records that start with like that look like a phone number, things like that. Start looking at the data validation. Is the data that you have in the system good? Um, once you're familiar with Power BI, step two in my what we usually recommend to clients, and in my opinion, is that data validation. So usually we say get comfortable with Power BI and then take a look at your data. Is it clean? Is it complete? Is it reliable? Is it valid? If it is, then you can start to use Power BI to actually see some trends and to really start to analyze the data that you have in there. If your data is incomplete, you can use that data validation to go back to your source and finish filling out the records so that you can move on to that analysis piece. So my tips and tricks to kind of wrap up what we've said, um, I recommend using an Excel file for your first report. Power BI looks very similar to Excel once it's pulled in. Um, it's a good transformation and transition into the platform, into Power BI. I also think it's the easiest connector to use. Um, so once you get connected with Excel, then I would say try and connect to something that has a native connector like a Salesforce or a SharePoint. Um, but start with Excel while you get comfortable with the platform. I also recommend picking a data set you're familiar with um, because then when you start to create tables or visualizations, you'll know if the data you're seeing looks right. If it doesn't look right, you'll be able to say, what am I filtering out that I shouldn't be? Um, maybe you anticipated seeing that you served 200 constituents in the last fiscal year. If you're only seeing 50, maybe you filtered on participants that identify as head of household and you need to remove that filter and then you can see all of the participants. So I say, um, Pick a data set you're familiar with so that you can quickly identify those things while you're getting started. Once you're more familiar with the interface, it's easier to identify like what is being filtered. I also recommend starting in the desktop application. It is possible to start in the web service. I think it's harder to use and it gives you less control over your data. So I recommend starting in the desktop application and planning to start in the desktop application for any report that you're going to create. Once you've created a report, there's a publish button. You can publish it to the web. When you're just getting started or if you're using the free version, when you publish, you'll get an option, what workspace do you want to publish to? If you choose my workspace, you can get access to reports from anywhere. And when you log in with your 365 credentials and you go to Power BI, the first thing you're gonna see is my workspace. So it makes it easier to find that report once it's published. And then I would say create some workspaces to share reports with others. So you will need a pro license for that, but as you start to create reports or you wanna start working on reports together collaboratively in your organization, you can create a workspace for that. Some people create a workspace called Test Power BI, and that's the workspace that host the reports that they're starting to create with other users while they're figuring out the interface. I think that's fine. I, I think that's a great way for you to keep all of those reports in one space. Then as you start to build out reports for your organization, you can create other workspaces for those departments. So I'd like to, I think we left about 20 minutes or so. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, Joyce, I'm not sure if we have any yet. Yes, yes, we do. So first, I want to thank you so much for your informative presentation. Um, so for the people who are still with us, we do have some time for Q&A. So if you haven't entered your question, please do so now. Um, for now, we have a couple that I will ask on behalf of our audience. The first one is, do you need to use Microsoft 365 to access Power BI? Yeah, that's a great question. So you when you first create a Power BI, when you go to download the desktop, you'll need to create a, an account for Power BI. If you already use Microsoft 365, you can use your email address 
and username to log in and you'll have access to the free Power BI. If you don't use Microsoft 365, you can create an account using your email address and password. Um, that account will be registered with Microsoft, but it doesn't have to be affiliated with your organization, like with an organizational tenant. You have to create an account though so that you can log in. Um, that gets complicated a little bit if you want to use pro licenses because the users that you want to share with will also need to create a to register and create an account with Microsoft. At that time, you would have to have um, a tenant configured so that users could be licensed with pro licenses. So to get started, no. Um, and even to use it, it doesn't mean that you have to move your email over or your file um, solution over. You could just use 360, Microsoft 365 for Power BI, but if you're gonna use Pro, yes, you have to create a tenant so that you can license users. That's great. Thank you so much for the thorough answer. Uh, so our next question is more of a scenario. So this nonprofit, they have a fiscal year that runs from September 1st to August 31st. Um, so they're having trouble presenting that data uh, or having that data present in a, in a nice format. So do you have any tricks for addressing this? Yeah, so usually what we do is we create additional, like if you're using Power BI to do that, we create additional columns for fiscal year and fiscal year date. Um, there are a couple ways to do it. One is if you're just reporting across the fiscal year, you could put a date slicer in and use the between and you can set the dates on there. So you could say, the starting date is September 1, 2019. The ending date is 8-31-2020. And it'll show um, fiscal year to date information. The alternative is if you create another column called fiscal year, that you could, every record that has a date would also have a correlated fiscal year. And you could filter on just the fiscal year column. Okay, that's perfect. Um, so our next question is actually a combination of a, of a few comments. So a lot of our audience is also using Google for Nonprofits G Suite. Um, yeah. For those of you who are not familiar, it's like the Google equivalent of the Microsoft Cloud with Sheets and Docs. Um, is there any type of compatibility? Is there any way that Power BI can integrate or interface with anything from the G Suite? Yeah, so there is a way to use Google Sheets as a source for Power BI. Um, there's a setting that you have to turn on in the Google Sheet that allows it to be publicly visible. And then you can use Google Sheets um, direct, you can use Power BI um, to directly connect. And there's like a web connector. And the idea of the web connector is it can connect to any website. The Google Sheet just becomes a, a website in the view of Power BI. Um, okay. It doesn't it doesn't connect to like folders or team sites or things like that though. So you're really you're if you had multiple Google Sheets, you'd have to connect to each of them as their own source. Okay, so it's just more of like another source of uh, raw data. Yeah. A data Absolutely. Set. Um, so our next question is: um, Is there a limitation in terms of data size? Like if they have different sources of data, is there a limit on how many sources they can connect to Power BI? Yeah, so um, this is kind of a tough question to answer. So my response is that Microsoft doesn't do anything without limits, generally. Um, but it, there, I'm, so I'm sure there is a limit to how many sources you can connect. In my experience, when you're connecting more than like 10 or 15 sources to a report, um, it gets confusing to keep track of those sources. Not that it's not possible, it's just that's about the point where those reports get to be really large and it might be worth considering a different solution for the data and then connecting it to Power BI, like a warehouse or something like that. Um, as far as the actual size of the data, the data is measured by the data that you actually import into, the, into Power BI. With a free license, you can import up to a gigabyte of data with the pro license, you're limited to 10 gigabytes of data. Um, I think you start to hit those limits when you work with really big data. Um, for m many organizations that we work with, we don't come anywhere near those. Um, so when you're bringing in flat files 
or connecting directly to a source like a SQL server, you're using hardly any data at all. Okay, and this is sort of a, along the same lines of different um, data sources. So I'm grouping a few questions from our audience into one. Is there sure. um, a way for Power BI to natively connect with other third-party soft or uh, databases like Razor's Edge, um, Smartsheets, or another type of donor database? So some, yes. Um, I think, so Razor's Edge, I don't believe there's a connector currently for Razor's Edge. I think Razor's Edge you have to actually export out and bring in as an Excel sheet. Um, Smartsheets, I think, does have a connector. Um, I'm just blanking on what it's called. There's a Smartsheets has a has a way that you can configure the sheet itself so that other sources can connect to it, and Power BI supports that connector. Um, there are a lot of third-party tools have an API that can be configured, and Power BI can connect directly to. So if it's a third-party solution that has an API, um, a lot of times Power BI can connect to that. Um, so like for example, we work with quite a few organizations recently who want to connect directly to ETO, um, efforts outcomes. And ETO has a, a connect, an API that Power BI could connect to. Um, and then it's just, it's a matter of cost at that point. Um, if, it's, if it's cost prohibitive, you can ex export the Excel sheets or schedule the export of the Excel sheets. Um, and if it's not, you can correct, connect directly to the data source. That's great, and I thank you so much for answering that. I know there's so many different databases to to be aware of, but that's that's great. Um, so for our audience, just just to keep in mind um, to look into what type of software you're using and if it, if it does have an API compatibility uh, feature. Uh, so our next question is: Is Power BI suitable for handling sensitive confidential information under various privacy legislation? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it can be, it can definitely be configured in a way that it maintains compliance with those like regulatory requirements. Um, it has the ability to do real level security. So if you had a data source that came in and you knew you were going to share this and there were certain users that had access to certain sets of information, you can create security groups within Power BI so that when a user logs in to look at it, they have access to only a certain subset of that data. Um, but beyond that, Power BI lives in Microsoft, which has you know, made sure that their products are able to be compliant with those um, regulatory requirements. Thank you so much for clarifying. Um, so our next question is, can an organization host a Power BI web server on premise? Yeah. Um, so. That's a good question. I don't think that there's an on-premise version. There is a premium version of Power BI, which allows you to license basically everyone in your organization, but I believe that it's hosted in an Azure VM. I don't think that it can be an on-premise option. Um, it, you could look into it under the Power BI premium would be what you're looking at. Um, and then you can select like how many cores it runs off of and what kind of bandwidth you need. But I think that it's only available through like a virtual. I don't think that it, you're able to host it. Um, but that wouldn't, you would still use the web serv service to access those reports. Um, it's just the licensing is a little bit different. Nope, that makes perfect sense. Um, so the next question that kind of relates back to when we're talking about uh, connecting to different uh, third party data sources. Um, so the question is, who do you recommend at the nonprofit? Who should be setting up these connect connections to applications such as sales, Salesforce or other third-party um, software? Should it be like the database administrator? And what happens if the nonprofit doesn't have like a dedicated tech team? Yeah, that's a really good question. So a lot of times we see the IT resource, whether it's a DBA or like an outsourced IT, um, help to connect to the data. But a lot of times the individuals that are actually driving the content of the reports are those that are in it, 
right? Like your program directors and your, or your program managers or um, your finance staff. Like a lot of times it's not your IT team that's actually driving the content of the reports. So I would say the, like having a, a database administrator or an IT person actually create those connections um, would is generally what we see. Um, we offer, we work with a lot of nonprofits. So a lot of nonprofits that don't have a DBA or an internal IT that can do that. We offer, we help them with connecting the data and building the re reports to their requirements. So I would say you could look at those services. We do it, there are other organizations that do that as well. Um, so I would say, yeah, IT usually connects them, but programs or other um, staff usually drive the content. And if you don't have somebody that can connect them, like we could be that, or I'm sure TechSoup, I'm sure you have other partners that also offer that as a similar service. Nope, that's that's great. Um, so the next question is, if they would like to publish some reports to the public, is there any way to display the Power BI reports on the web with no login or guest login of some kind? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, in the report itself, in the service, there's an option that says publish to the web, and then in parentheses it has public. It'll give you a URL, or it'll give you, yeah, a URL, and also an embed code. So you can either embed that in your website, or you can use a link on your website to direct it to that URL. But yeah, there's no sign-in required when you publish it publicly. That's, that's great to hear. Um, so before I ask the next question, Alyssa, do you mind just forwarding your slide to the resource section. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry about that. So our, a lot of our uh, attendees can just look at it and, and peruse the resources if necessary. Uh, so the next question is, so this nonprofit, their data analyst is in a different location. Um, do you, would, would you then recommend the web version for them as opposed to the desktop version of Power BI? I would still recommend the desktop. Um, I would just recommend that they create in the desktop and then publish to the web. I think the desktop has a, so much more functionality um, and I think it's so much easier to use to create reports. So my common practice is create in the desktop and as soon as I'm done, even if I'm not totally done with the report, I publish it to the web so that it's accessible from anywhere. You can also download the report from the web if you're a user that it's shared with or if it's your report. So you could download it in another space and pick up at any time. Well, that's that's really great to know and thank you again for clarifying that distinction. Um, the next question is um, about the Power BI reports in Microsoft Teams. Uh, is it necessary to, to have a Power BI Pro license for people who um, want to access or consume the report? Or is there a way to allow people to view the report or, or access the reports on the free plan? Yeah, so if you, regardless of if you're adding a tab to Teams or anywhere else, if you want to consume that report, you have to have a pro license. Um, the person who shared the report has to have a pro license. The person who consumes it also has to have a pro license. The Caveat to that is if you public a, publish a report publicly, publish it to the web, you don't have to have a pro license to view that. Um, but I always like to remind organizations that's not really a good workaround for not buying the pro licenses because it does expose any of that data. Anybody that gets access to that link can see that report. So you wanna make sure when you're publishing publicly, it's actually data that should be available to the public. That's a really good uh, sober reminder because I know a lot of us like to look at some of the workarounds um, and or try to stay on the free plan for as long as possible. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of like pro and, and the free plan, in terms of support from Microsoft, if nonprofits are accessing just the free version, um, would there still be support available or some helpline um, and are there other resources that could be used if they have any questions around Power BI? Yeah, I find the discussion forum that's listed on here to be incredibly helpful. Um, anytime I run into an issue in Power BI, that's the first place that I go to because chances are someone else has had that exact same question. Anything from connecting a data source to doing some really complicated thing, it's, it's all in there. Um, so I find that to be the best source. 
there is an, in any of the applications, you can click help and you can go through their, um, the Microsoft like help support community. Um, and I think that's okay. If you are a Microsoft 365 user, like you have a tenant there, you can put a ticket in with Microsoft support, even on the free, if you're just using Power BI desktop, you can still put a ticket into Microsoft and get support on any issues um, that you're having with that. But I would recommend starting with that community.powerbi.com or that discussion forum. That's great to hear that there's a really active community of support around Power BI. Um, and definitely for uh, those who are interested in using it, please make full use of these online resources. Uh, so the next question is around published reports. Um, so whether it's through the free or paid version, would published reports update automatically if you are updating it on the back end? Yeah, so once you publish the report, when you go into the Power BI service on the web, there's a space in there. And if you click on, there's some like little ellipses next to your data set. So when you publish your report and then you go to that workspace, you're gonna see the report itself. And below, you're gonna see the data set that hosts all the information for the report. On that data set, you have it, there's an option to schedule refresh, which, and then you can select the times that you want that refresh to happen. So you could say at 6 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m., I wanna refresh the data. Power BI will go to the data source, get the new data information, and refresh the report automatically. So you can configure that scheduled refresh. If your data source is a server or like a, a desktop file or something like that, Power BI is a gateway that you can use that allows it to actually go pull those files from those on-premise locations as well. So it's one step for cloud sources, two steps, including a gateway for on-premise sources. Well, that's very good, good to hear. Um, less work on our end if we need to update <laughs> yeah. our numbers. Um, so speaking of embedding reports, uh, do you know uh, the, I guess, the, the capabilities of the, of the embed, embedded Power BI reports, can you embed them into an existing website? Like where, I mean, I guess what I'm trying to ask is what, what kind of format um, do you need in order to embed a report? Yeah, so you can, um, it just, it gives you an embed, it's like an iframe, it gives you an embed code. So you can put it in an existing website. Um, you can put it in any page where you can add like a script, it's a script code. So anywhere you can add a script to embed an image, you can add, you can embed a report. Um, if you're using SharePoint, there's a web part that you can use to embed Power BI on your SharePoint intranet pages. So there's a, in the modern uh, SharePoint, there's a web part called Power BI and you can paste the report URL in there and that'll embed it there. But outside of SharePoint, you can just copy and paste. It's got the whole code in there, including the size and everything you can paste that directly into your current website or whatever you're going to embed it in. Okay, that sounds good. Just as long as it's something that can support iframes. Um, yeah. So, okay, so I, I'll just make a note to the audience. This will be the last question. If you have a question that uh, was not asked verbally out loud, please um, stay and fill out the post webinar survey. Uh, you can, specify that you know you want us to follow up with you afterwards or if you have any additional questions. So last question for today, does Power BI have a scripting functionality? So for example, if they build in a script so that uh, users and guests can request the subset of data from them, does it have that functionality? Um, my instinct says no, but I don't, I, I don't know. I would ask for some more clarification on that question, I think. Um, when you, when users, so when users try to access a report, if it's not shared with them, they have the ability to request access to it. If there's row level security configured in a report, an administrator would have to go in and create a security group and then grant access to a specific user. There may be a way to use PowerShell to create those security groups. I'd have to look into that. I haven't done it, um, but I'm not sure that there could be like an automated process for that. So not really sure how to answer the question, um, but I would say probably not. I think it would be a little more manual than an automated script. 
No, that's fair enough. And I also understand when I was asking that, that this might be a little bit more technical, but thank you for answering it too, um, like on, honestly. Uh, so again, this is all the time that we have for today. Alyssa, thank you so, so much for sharing your knowledge with us and also for taking the time out of your day to present this. Um, I also want to thank everyone again for taking time out of their lunch hour or taking time out of their day to join us for this webinar. Just a reminder that we will post the webinar recording to our website shortly. Um, please also fill out the post webinar survey that will launch right after the session um, so that we can continuously improve our educational content and webinars in the future. Thank you everyone again. Stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.